Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started with our final session um, for today. The new session is a natural resource management moving forward. I would like to introduce Katie Keel, who will be giving a talk on understanding and advancing natural resource management in the context of climate change. Katie Keel is an interdisciplinary environmental scientist at 48 North Solutions, where she provides regulatory and natural resource services, including marine and freshwater environmental compliance support. She has a BS in environmental science from Oklahoma State University and a master's in marine affairs and graduate certificate in climate science from the University of Washington. At UW, her research focused on understanding and quantifying the ecological effects of environmental stressors, such as ocean acidification and their implications for human systems. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction and hello everyone. I really appreciate you tuning into my talk today, especially because here in Seattle is a beautiful sunny day. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. Is it gonna let me? Okay. Great. Um, so yes, as Bridget said, my name is Katie Kyle. I'm an environmental scientist at 48 North Solutions. We are an environmental consulting group in Issaquah, Washington. We provide a wide range of services, everything from comprehensive environmental planning to natural resource management services. But the work that I'm gonna present today is from my time as a graduate student in the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs and the Program on Climate Change or PCC. So the project that I'm presenting today was actually my PCC capstone. So before I begin, I wanna recognize my project partners because without them, this work wouldn't have been possible. So I worked really closely with my colleague, Nisa Russell within the PCC, and we collaborated with Kirsten Feifel, who at the time was at the Department of Natural Resources. She's now at Puget Sound Partnership. And we worked with Rich Childers, who at the time was with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, but he is now retired. <laughs> so with that, I've got a lot of information to share today. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So as I'm sure everyone is aware, and as we've heard from talks today, Washington waters are changing and they're changing due to ocean acidification, warming temperatures and hypoxia. So to support science-based policies and management decisions, we started at the source, and we determined the source to be the questions and concerns of natural resource managers to determine how these changing ocean conditions are impacting resources and what we need to best respond. So this project ended up spanning about four years. So we had a lot of objectives and we had a lot of evolving objectives, but I think it can be distilled pretty succinctly into these um, objectives. The first being identify concerns and information needs regarding changing ocean conditions, informing future priorities based on management and policy implications, improve linkages and coordination among partners, and finally to understand how information can best reach managers. So we tackle these objectives with a three-phase approach. The first phase being informational interviews with um, state and tribal resource manager across the state. We tried to get a really wide representation across Washington because we use these interviews to inform our survey design, which was phase two, an online survey. So we distilled themes from these interviews to create this survey, which we were then able to distribute to a wider group because you can only interview so many people. And then two years later, after that initial survey, we conducted a follow-up survey to understand um, if priorities have changed over time and to get a little fine, finer level detail on those survey responses. Oops. So jumping into phase one, as I said, we conducted informational interviews with state and tribal natural resource managers. We ended up with a total of 27 resource managers interviewed. Um, 19 were state, eight were tribal, and that was across three state agencies and five tribes. Interview management authority included everything from uh, wild stock finfish and shellfish to forage fish, water quality, including biotoxins and aquatic vegetation. And we transcribed these interviews, coded them to identify themes. So to highlight some of those themes, first and foremost, 
was plankton. Plankton was brought up in every single interview. Um, and the context varied whether it was composition, abundance, food web, um, so on. But natural resource managers understood that impacts to plankton reverberate throughout the food web. So regardless of what they're managing, um, plankton likely play a role. So there's a clear need to understand plankton communities in our local waters. Additionally, we need to identify species tolerances and thresholds, downscale models to local areas of concern. So we found that data was often abundant, but it was not available at the scale necessary to make essential management decisions. And then finally, increasing monitoring stations, both river and marine. So without monitoring this critical habitat, it's difficult to assess whether responses um, what the responses are to physical conditions. So we poured over hours and hours and hours and hours of interviews. So I felt it would be a disservice if I didn't give a voice to our findings. So to quote one interviewee, they said, there's no way of exactly identifying the type of consequences when the rubber hits the road. What's causing the anxiety is the unknown. We don't know the type of impact or the magnitude. And I felt that this really reflected what we heard over and over again about the difficulty of managing around the unknown. So moving into the second phase, which was the survey, we designed an online survey that we distributed to a wider audience. So this extended beyond managers. We um, also included end users, industry, so on, essentially anyone who would respond to our survey uh, with a focus on the marine environment, uh, we are willing to listen. So we distributed it in 2018 and questions included everything from resources and habitat managed to concerns, data uses and gaps, barriers, so on and so forth. And the goal again was to get a wide representation across Washington. And as you can see, I think we did a pretty decent job. We got a total of 90 complete responses from 45 entities. And so this was a pretty diverse array. It was everything from Northwest Straits Commission to Puget Sound Crab Association and even three fishermen. So before diving into the results, I do wanna point out that our project partner, Rich, who works for uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife was really good at getting the word out. And so that's something to keep in mind as I go through our results that our survey disproportionately captures that fish and wildlife perspective. So I think it's important to begin with what data is currently being used to manage resources in Washington to serve as a sort of scaffolding for the remainder of our findings. So when asked what information is currently used, we provided 11 options. Um, and as you can see, coming in at first, tied for first at 41 and 40% is historical and annual species distribution and composition data. And then at that third, fourth place, however you want to look at it, at 33%, we have recent and projected environmental conditions. So this really isn't too surprising, given 89% of our survey respondents manage or monitor organisms. So the data that they're using is where the organisms used to be, where they are today, and what conditions are expected to look like in the near term. Moving into concerns, we asked about the level of concern from not concerned to very concerned for seven oceanic parameters. So these include ocean acidification, sea level rise, water temperature, estuarine circulation, salinity changes, hypoxia, and eutrophication. And what we found was ocean acidification and water temperature are the most concerning oceanic parameters. Approximately 70% of respondents chose the highest level of concern for ocean acidification. So when listening to these interviews, we uncovered a lot of themes. And we noticed that different groups were more concerned about different issues. So for example, when talking to people who manage fisheries, we found ocean conditions determined recruitment. 
OA and changing temperatures are most concerning. But when talking to the tribes, we found, for example, the primary concern for one tribe is sea level rise. Quote, we're already seeing some of the beaches that are culturally and economically important disappearing or have disappeared already. So since we found this really strong signal in the interviews, we are interested in teasing this apart with the survey data, who's most concerned about what, but unfortunately, as you can see here, uh, this, there wasn't a strong trend reflected in the survey. So recall, very concerned is the highest level of concern, and these different colors in, these, in this bar chart correspond to um, the different organization or agency that they work for. So. Um, most of these are about the same size throughout, and this is likely for a lot of reasons, but primarily because each response was treated as an individual data point. So respondents were able to select very concerned for each environmental parameter. So even though they may be most concerned about ocean acidification, they're also very concerned about all these other parameters. So that's for another day. So moving into what I like to call our big kahuna question of the survey, we asked what the top option, so what is the most beneficial thing to help you address the potential impacts of changing ocean conditions on the natural resources that you work with? We provided 15 different research data or monitoring priorities that were frequently identified in the interviews. And what we found was the top priority is by all biological responses of species to changing ocean conditions. So there's still this clear need to prioritize laboratory and in situ studies to identify survival thresholds. Coming in at the second highest priority is the current abundance of shellfish and fish species. So again, this makes sense because that's the information that they're currently using to manage their organisms. We also heard that Baselines are no longer representative. Many managers don't have estimates on abundance for the species that they manage. So as you can imagine, if you're a natural resource manager and you don't know where or how many of your species even exist, that can be, that can be a challenge. And then at the third priority is the impact of large scale oceanographic factors at localized scales. So this is an indication that we need to scale down our models to local areas of concern. Models are great and they can be incredibly informative, but they're not as helpful as they could be if they're not at the scale needed. So I do want to point out that our results indicated, this was another question that I, I'm not covering in this slideshow, but results indicated that the scale of Puget Sound was actually the preferred scale. So it's not even necessary to scale these down to basin level or local embayment. Um, Puget Sound scale is fine. So moving into phase three, which was the follow-up survey, um, we created another online survey and we distributed this in 2022 or 2020. Um, so this was two years after the initial survey. We sent it to the same respondents that we initially got, um, but also we sent it out through the Marine Resource Advisory Council to serve and some other vectors relying on the snowball method of sampling. So we didn't limit this survey to only the initial respondents. Some of the goals were to update and refine the 2018 survey results and to better understand the communication needs and preferences of survey participants. So who responded? Well, compared to the 90 responses that we received in 2018, we only had 26 responses this time. And again, mostly at the state level, you'll see 54% um, were from the state level and they were predominantly self-identifying as researchers or scientists. So 14 out of the 26 identified as that. So we've got this smaller pie, but there's still a lot of slices. So we still have, um, you know, the tribal perspective, commercial fishing, aquaculture. Um, so we still, we still have all those views captured. So as you may recall from the 2018 survey, the highest priority was understanding species response to changing ocean conditions. So 
is this still a priority? And we got a resounding yes. So 92% of participants affirm that yes, two years later, this is still a priority. So in the initial survey, we didn't ask about which biology or which species you're interested in understanding these responses to changing ocean conditions. So in this follow-up survey, we asked them to expand upon this priority. We provided it as a write-in option. Um, and what we found was dungeness crabs, harmful algal blooms, and salmon were the most frequently mentioned organisms. But I do wanna mention, I didn't lead you astray with all my talk of zooplankton. Um, zooplankton was still a priority and was the fourth most mentioned group. But regardless of species, participants expressed concerns about larval and juvenile stages. So what do respondents need to feel more equipped to address these changing ocean conditions? First, they need communication materials. So interpretive pro products, which translate technical information into more accessible forms, uh, this could take a variety of shapes. And we had a lot of, a lot of suggestions, um, some of them being a quarterly web publication that summarizes the most recently available data collected in the Salish Sea, uh, interactive web tools showing trends through time across sectors, regions, just interactive mapping tools um, would be fantastic. But it was interesting to hear that funds often exist to generate data, but they don't always exist to summarize or interpret the data. And that's a really crucial step. So communication materials linking the science to more digestible material. Also increased monitoring, so continued and expanded monitoring efforts. And then finally, a website clearinghouse of georeferenced data. So we heard throughout the entirety of the project that a data clearinghouse would be amazing, a way for everyone to combine all the data that's collected within the region. And this would help address the sentiment that there are too many disparate data sets that are difficult to track down, access, and integrate. So we know what information is being used, and we know what's concerning, and we know what information is needed. So how should we deliver this information to natural resource managers? Well, what we found was that there is a preference for scientific literature and in-person workshops and meetings. Of course, um, scientific journal makes sense. We have mostly uh, researchers and scientists responding to this survey, but it's important to note that other literature that I found whenever I was analyzing these results show that natural resource managers do prefer journal articles across the board. In terms of the in-person workshops and meetings, I think that's of course difficult in the times of COVID, um, but opportunities like today's symposium are fantastic and um, they're often more accessible than in-person workshops, so cuts off to today's planners. Um, but regardless, any of these methods can help harmonize applicable science with resource management actions. So to conclude, we clearly need to determine species thresholds. There's a need to prioritize laboratory or in situ studies, identifying survival thresholds of vital organisms, specifically zooplankton, fish, and dungeness crab. We currently don't have species thresholds to compare to model predictions yet, or at least that's what we've heard from the natural resource managers that we have been talking to. We need to separate climate change from national, natural variations, so doing the impossible because making management decisions becomes increasingly difficult when you don't know whether the changes you're seeing are cyclical or they're due to climate change. And then finally, improve collaboration and communication. So coordinate and share monitoring efforts and, re and research within and among entities and compile them in that accessible database that I mentioned. So that database would really help foster collaboration. We need more interdisciplinary collaborative projects so that we collectively can all take advantage of the full scientific state of knowledge. And again, scientific literature and in-person workshops are the preferred way of doing this. 
So although this project focused on dealing with ocean conditions and what's already been handed to us, I think it's so important to reflect on how crucial mitigation is. And I felt like this interviewee summarized it really nicely. They said, how do you absorb growing population in a way that it does not harm ecosystems that are remaining? We need to protect remaining intact ecosystems. It's easier to protect than to rebuild. So with that, of course, I couldn't cover everything over the lifespan of our four-year project um, in this presentation. So if you're interested in diving deeper into our results or looking at our methodology, we did publish in the Coastal Management Journal in 2021. That's open access, so feel free to give that a read. Um, but also we have a TLDR version that lives on the Marine Resource Advisory Council's website. But do note that this includes only the interviews and the 2018 survey data, so it doesn't capture those um, 20, 2020 results. And again, huge thank you to everyone that made this you know, mammoth effort possible, my project partners and everyone else who was integral to this project, but especially a huge thank you to uh, the PCC for fostering and facilitating this collaboration. And also thank you. And with that, I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Katie. Are, are there any questions from the group? Could you talk a little bit more on the need to incorporate communications into this? Yeah. What specifically? Because I feel like that's a that's a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, this is Eleanor. Sorry. Um, I was trying to type the question quickly. Um, no problem. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess I mean it in multiple aspects, but um, I think uh, like how is how is the communication piece missed and like how can we maybe better incorporate it like you mentioned that um, I think sometimes projects have funding to you know do the research but then you know the research doesn't necessarily get communicated in a way that anything really comes about it that um, would be nice to see so I was wondering if you might be able to talk about maybe some solutions to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've personally even felt this with my own research that I've done where it's like you produce you produce all this data and then you analyze it and then I present it at a few conferences um, and then I just kind of feel like it disappears into the void. I'm like somebody should be able to use this information. I think and from what I've heard, there are a few ways of tackling this. I think having more collaborative efforts you know, natural resource manager is saying, oh, I don't even have an estimate for, for this thing, or, oh, I need this parameter collected at this location at this frequency. That was part of what this project was trying to do was connect and identify these, these problems or these data gaps with people who are willing to fill the data gaps. Because there are some efforts going on asking these big questions, but until you connect, like, I need this information, and then other people are doing research over here that aren't addressing this. We were trying to link the two groups together. So in order to do that, collaborative projects from the beginning, I need this information, I'm doing this research, link them together, but also producing data at the scale, hearing these, these concerns and these issues, and, and making an effort to produce the data at the scale that's needed um, and interpreting it because a lot of us wear a lot of hats and we know a lot but we are kind of jacks of all trades and so having somebody who is the expert interpreting that for us and serving it up with a bow I think will help with that but really the data clearinghouse like time and time again uh, came up and I think that that is the biggest priority is developing that and getting that out and getting that communicated to everyone that that is being developed and it is on its way. And this is a way to integrate um, that in workshops. 
again, because that the face-to-face -face and the, oh, you're doing that. I didn't even know that that existed or I didn't know that this organization was doing that. Um, I think those are some of the tools, but we do expand upon that um, to, to stop me from rambling. Uh, we do expand upon that in uh, our publication as well. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. All right, we have one from Hannah. Could, could we see the slide with the participants in the first survey from 2018? And the question is, do you see any absences of groups that you wish had responded in the first year? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we really tried, well, I think one of the benefits was we were able to target the interviews to who we wanted to talk to specifically and who we felt gave us a pretty good general across the board take. So we were able to do that really targeted approach. Of course, surveys are complicated. Um, you can't always convince people to take them. So you kind of just have to take what you get. Um, and we did leave it open for six weeks. So we left the survey open for a, a pretty long time. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember any huge gaps because we did, or what I felt and the project team felt like were big gaps because, um, like I said, we were pretty vocal and we were able to, to really pressure some people to take the survey to get those um, perspectives. But that, that is a great question. And I'm sure anybody could have different answers to that and pieces that were missing. But off the top of my head, there wasn't anything that we identified. Great, thank you. We have another question from Devin. Did you gather any insight into how the pace of collaboration and cooperation, i.e. the human social process of getting stakeholders together to problem solve compares to the pace of climate change? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we got a lot of frustrations. Anybody who's worked in climate science or works in this environment. I mean, climate change is so pervasive. Everybody who works anywhere is dealing with this. Um, but we had some, I, dare, I shouldn't say comical, but some of the write-in narratives that we got from our surveys were just so frustrated. Um, and that's really where the no's came from in the 2020 survey, where like, is this still a priority? People are like, no, it's too late. Like, we don't have time to gather this data. We just need to start doing things, we need action. Um, so anyone who's worked in this knows it's hard uh, getting everybody to the table and making progress quickly. Um, and yes, climate change is here, it's been here and we're seeing the repercussions and we're, we're slow to the game. So there's definitely frustrations about the pace and how these paces are completely off from each other. Great, thank you so much. Well, we are just at the end here. Um, we have one more discussion in our next session. And so we'll, we'll see you in the, in the next one. But Katie, thank you so much. This was a really Great. good presentation. Perfect, thanks everyone.